And we've got plenty of sunshine out there again, but we can't seem to get these temperatures over the 40 degree mark. We'll blow by it tomorrow. We'll look at a big warm up on Wednesday right now. First at four. Local 4 News starts now with a breaking news alert. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Karen Drew. First at four, Governor Gretchen Whitmer is loosening a bunch of coronavirus restrictions in the state. She warns us we still need to be careful, but we can begin to enjoy some small pleasures again. Here's some of those changes. Restaurants and bars will now be up to 50% capacity, up to 100 people. Curfew now pushed to 11 p.m. for those restaurants. Gatherings at retail settings are up to 50% of occupancy. Limits set by the fire marshal. Indoor entertainment facilities can now be 50% capacity, up to 300 people. Indoor residential gatherings are up to 15 people from three different households. The changes are in effect this Friday, March 5th through April 19th. All of these re-engagements will enable Michiganders to enjoy more of life's simplest pleasures that have been disrupted over the past year. Going out for a meal with your family, a date night to go see the new cheesy rom-com, a coffee with your grandma. These are the things that make our lives full. You can review all the changes in the safety protocols we still need to follow at clickondetroit.com. Also, Detroit is now allowing manufacturing employees that live or work in the city to start getting their COVID vaccines. The state just announced more than 1,000 new cases of the virus in the past day. We've also seen an additional 24 deaths. Our COVID coverage continues tonight at 5 with a first reaction from restaurants to that increased capacity. Much more when you join us in one hour. Now, a new partnership will help boost COVID vaccine production. The White House has announced the drug maker Merck and Company will help produce the vaccine created by business rival Johnson & Johnson. J&J &J is hoping to produce 100 million doses by the end of June, but face some unexpected production issues. This switch should help the company meet its goal. All right, closer to home. Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan speaking out today after two alleged drunk driving incidents involving city firefighters. Last week, a firefighter was accused of driving drunk when the fire engine he was driving hit a woman's car during a call. Then, an acting fire chief was arrested and accused of driving under the influence while on duty. Today, Mayor Duggan announced a four-point plan to attack the issue working with management and the union, but he also says there is a zero tolerance policy for consuming alcohol on the job. The people of the city of Detroit are entitled to know that the men and women they are counting on to come save them are free of the influence of alcohol or any other restricted substances. And so what we have decided to do is approach this together. Uh, we're not here to focus on who's to blame, we're focusing on how we're going to solve it. Local 4 defender Sean Lay will dive into the mayor's plan at 5. He's been on the story for weeks, and you can also see the previous coverage on our defenders page at clickondetroit.com. A final review is done almost four months after Election Day, and Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson says a statewide audit confirms Michigan's results are accurate. 250 of the state's election audits were completed by more than 1,300 clerks. One audit reviewed every vote cast for president in Antrim County, and it found the Dominion machines accurately counted the ballots. An audit of Detroit's results confirmed the clerk's office properly counted 174,000 valid absentee ballots. Benson says rhetoric questioning the results must stop. No leader or person of power, elected or otherwise, should have ever played political games with the integrity of our elections. But those who did must stop now. These audits, carried out by hundreds of clerks across the political spectrum and hailing from all parts of our state, make it clear that it is time to acknowledge the truth and move forward. Now, we did reach out to several members of the GOP about the results of the audit, and we are waiting to hear back from them. If you're outside early this morning, you definitely felt that lingering winter chill. Ben Bailey standing by with our first forecast. How much have we warmed up, Ben? Uh, well, from this morning, quite a bit, Karen, but we're still pretty close to where we were yesterday afternoon at this time. But we got the sunshine back, and it looks fantastic out there. A lot of 30s, wind chills right now in the 20s area-wide, so it still feels 
like it's uh, definitely winter, but you can see where we're making improvements, and that's off to our north and west. 25 to 30 degrees warmer there in the northern Plain states. That warmth's headed here. We'll look at that, and when we'll finally see another snowflake, because it may be a while, all coming up in a few minutes. Karen? Yeah. All right, we can wait for that snow. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Today we are following new fallout from the January 6th siege on Capitol Hill. The director of the FBI facing some questions about the attack itself and the threat of domestic terrorism. Kimberly Gill has been sorting through the testimony and joins us with the very latest. Kim. Hi, Karen. Good afternoon. FBI Director Christopher Wray faced the Senate Judiciary Committee for several hours. Probably one of the most disturbing assessments had to do with a growing threat inside the United States. Take a listen. We've increased the number of domestic terrorism investigations from around 1,000 or so when I got here to up to about 1,400 at the end of last year to about 2,000 now. Ray took office in 2017, which means domestic terrorism investigations have doubled in the past four years. The FBI director shed little light on whether his intelligence experts missed warning signs before the riot at the U.S. Capitol. He was asked why the FBI did not issue a threat assessment before January 6th, and if the information gathered should have been shared more aggressively with agencies on the front lines of Capitol Hill. It was, as you noted, uh, raw, unverified, uncorroborated information uh, that had been posted online. Uh, and my understanding, was that that information was quickly, as in within an hour, uh, disseminated and communicated with our partners. I didn't see the report myself even until after the 6th. But, but the way in which it handled, at least as I understand it, uh, strikes me as consistent with our normal process. Ray also testified the Capitol was not organized by anyone posing as supporters of former President Trump. There's more testimony we'll share with you tonight when you join us for Local 4 News at 5. We hope to see you then. For now, Karen, we'll send it back to you. All right. Thank you, Kim. All right. Now, just an awful story from California this afternoon. First responders are on the scene of a deadly crash involving an SUV and a semi-truck. Hospital officials say there were 25 passengers in the SUV that struck that semi-truck filled with gravel. 13 people have died, with over a dozen people hospitalized. Some are in intensive care. This happened east of San Diego, about 10 miles north of the U.S.-Mexico border. The cause is under investigation. He may have been one of the most powerful men in America who wasn't necessarily a household name. Today, we learned Vernon Jordan has died. He rose from humble beginnings in the segregated South to become a civil rights champion, a Washington insider, and a corporate powerhouse. His friendship with Bill Clinton brought him to the White House as an unofficial aide to the president. Jordan once summed up his views on business and race by saying, quote, you don't take it out in anger, you take it out in achievement. He died last night surrounded by family. Vernon Jordan was 85 years old. The latest round of a racial reckoning is now reaching into children's literature involving the world-famous Dr. Seuss. The organization that controls his legacy has decided to stop publishing six of the author's books because of racist and insensitive imagery. Paula Tutman went looking for some perspective on a decision that has plenty of people talking. And the thing that I saw on Mulberry Street has a Chinaman who eats with sticks. Professor Philip Nell could be considered a Seussologist, well known in academia and considered a go-to expert, a professor of literature at Kansas State University. He's been writing about racism in children's literature long before the publishers of Dr. Seuss pulled licensing and publishing for six of his books. Some of the most uh, egregious ones come in If I Ran the Zoo. Professor Nell knows that there will be a conflation and deflection, that there will be people who say pulling titles from a beloved master storyteller is just going too far. But he and others will challenge you to actually look at the content. Here's the African island of Yurka, and you can see the caricature of the two African men who, I mean, they're not only drawn in caricature, but they're made to look a lot like the bird you know, which, which further makes a connection between them and animals. The way Asians are depicted in And to Think I Saw It on Mulberry Street, the caricatures of Middle Easterners in Scrambled Eggs Super, and on Beyond Zebra, and Inuits in McGilligot's Pool, and Africans called Pygmies in the Cat's Quizzer. I think about how can children's literature tell children the truth? How can we raise a generation of kids 
who weren't brought up on the lies that I was brought up on, you know? Um, and how can we raise a generation of kids who are willing to think carefully and critically about race, about racism, about how they benefit from it if they look like me. Professor Ellen Donovan is also a children's literature expert at Middle Tennessee State University. What may have been comic at one time now doesn't feel quite so funny anymore. So when Dr. Seuss is depicting people in ways that evoke stereotypes, we begin to recognize that may be harmful especially for children who are absorbing these stereotypes without much awareness of the background of those stereotypes and what those stereotypes might imply. Let's take it out of the kids' books. And that is responsible. And, you know, let's extend that responsibility to all of our culture. Let's make it better. Let's make the next generation of kids smarter than the current generation of kids, more compassionate than the current generation Okay, so now let's talk about the difference between censorship and recalibration. You can still get the book. The publisher and the owners are saying they just don't want to provide the book and sell the book. But I will say this, Karen. Interestingly enough, our assistant news director sent me a link that shows that these six books uh, on eBay have now gone from about fourteen ninety nine in one case to four thousand dollars. I would say if money doesn't talk, it screams. Wow. And so there you go. All right. Thank you very much, Paula.